I think a question many of us struggle with when reading Torah is how is it that women or men didn't protest the social order in ancient times? Our parasha offers a story which is relevant to this question, so let's see how we feel after we examine it. But let's start at the top. Pinchas, for whom our parasha is named for, is actually the hero of last week's Torah portion, and our story begins with the tail end of that one. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aharon HaKohen was a religious zealot. He brutally put an end to a plague inflicted on the Israelites for straying, committing adultery, and intermarrying with Moabite and Midianite women. I'll openly admit that this extreme act is a difficult one for me to relate to as a woman living in Israel in the 21st century, especially given the eternal blessing Pinchas receives from God at the beginning of our, beginning of our parsha, and even more so due to the approval rates his actions seem to get to this day. Luckily for me, the parsha quickly moves on to count B'nai Israel by tribe, giving mention to the main families in each of the tribes. When reaching the tribe of Menashe, as it lists Menashe's sons, we are unexpectedly introduced to the five daughters of Tzlofchad, Machla, Noa, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza. They're mentioned by name, nonchalantly, like it's totally natural to have five women mentioned by name as part of the Israelite count. I'll admit, this was my bat mitzvah parsha, and at the age of 12, I totally overlooked this element in the story, something that truly puzzles me and even embarrasses me somewhat today. If that isn't surprising enough, once the count is done, we encounter the unique story of these five women, a story which is much easier to relate to. So a group of people, five women, members of what is essentially an oppressed group within society, comes forward, approaches Moshe, raises its voice, demanding to, so to alter social order. And this is a really big deal. You can probably tell from my voice and expressions how exceptional this story is, but let's spell it out. First of all, we're speaking of five women and minor characters at that. This isn't Miriam speaking or someone of her caliber. Second, they're mentioned by name, not referred to by their relationship to a man like Bat Yiftach, the daughter of Yiftach, Eshet Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, or Bat Paro, Pharaoh's daughter. They are named Machla, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza, not once, but twice within our Parsha. Third, these five women totally break protocol and speak directly to Moshe, no questions asked. Even though just a few weeks ago, when we read Behalotcha, we were introduced to a very organized judicial structure. They totally ignore that and go right to the top. You can imagine the scene. Moshe holding court under a tree or in a big tent, surrounded by men, lots of men. There's a lot of hustle and bustle, and then these five women come forward, and you can imagine how they're dressed. Maybe they have to push their way through to get in. Maybe they have to yell to get his attention. The court falls silent as they speak. Or maybe someone tries to shush them, or mansplain them, or try to push them out. I'm guessing we can all picture the scene. Finally, what they have to say seems to be in protest of accepted social order. They challenge the law of the land, which dictates that property which belongs to a man who has no sons, who can inherit him, is transferred automatically to the nearest male relative. The Hebrew text is very powerful. Lama yigara shem avinu. Why shall our father's name be subtracted from his family because he has no sons? They demand the opportunity to carry on their father's name as women. This might be translated to a woman choosing to keep her maiden name today. The root yigara of Yigara is Gimel Reish Ein, to subtract. It was used in another story we read a few weeks ago, also in Parashat Beha There, a group of people who were forbidden to join in the Passover rituals came to Moshe protesting the situation. In the words of the text, they said, Lama Nigara, why shall we be excluded or subtracted from the public ritual? Each of these stories poses a challenge to the law a new halachic question 
There's no ready man-made or God-made answer, so Moshe takes them up with God. In both cases, God's response is chiddish, a new ruling. In our story, God rationalizes the women's request as fair. The text reads, Ken bnot slofchad dovrot, what they say is just. And the law changes so that in lieu of sons, daughters can inherit land under certain restrictions. The law changes as a result of bnot slofchad's activism because they had the courage to call out injustice. Traditional commentary couldn't just ignore this. Some suggest that Moshe simply forgot the halakha which he had received at Sinai, while others say that at Sinai, what, received, what was received were the general rules, whereas the details were revealed as needed, because how could Moshe have forgot? The Talmud in Baba Batra goes out of its way to tell us how wise and righteous these five women were and how they actually deserve the halakha to be introduced in their name. Now we could argue whether what Machla, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza did was an act of feminism. At the end of the day, their request wasn't really to alter the patriarchy, but to ensure that their father's name was succeeded. So maybe not really something for us to get so excited about. According to biblical tradition and archeological findings, we know that at least three of the five women were later mentioned as having political importance in the Kingdom of Israel. The first capital city of the Kingdom of Israel before the city of Shomron, or Samaria, was a place called Tirza, which is mentioned in the book of Kings 1, chapter 16, verse 24. Chogla and Noah's names were both discovered on clay artifacts at an archeological dig in the ancient ruins of Sebastia, not far from Samaria, and most likely document districts in the land belonging to the tribe of Menashe. So what's the takeaway from this vignette? Well, firstly, it shines a light on women who sought equality and innovation and possibly obtained some form of leadership in biblical times. Because of the nature of Mideastern society at that time, we don't have many stories like this. Whether you believe the Torah was written by men or all the more so if you choose to believe that it was written by God, God accepting the challenge these women posed and changing the law to accommodate them is a big deal. It's even revolutionary. We can see that even in biblical times, Jewish law evolved to meet changing needs of society. Which brings me to my second takeaway, which is to view ourselves, our choices of how to live and celebrate our tradition, how we adapt, reimagine, and innovate within Judaism are all part of an organic evolution that's at the core of our tradition. And so long as we see ourselves as part of a larger global community and our actions as ways of sustaining Judaism today and ensuring its continuity, our Judaism connects us with our history and past, but also with communities around the world moving forward. And we should picture ourselves as part of this vibrant, international people. I began this video asking how it is that people didn't protest the social order in ancient times. In many ways, it's not really a fair question. It's anachronistic and it imposes our politics on ancient times. The story we looked at today is a vignette which suggests that social change occurred even during biblical times and women and men didn't always accept the lies received. So no, I don't think that we can say that they were big feminists. But stories like this, which highlight change and innovation, empower me as a woman, as a mother, as a Jew, who knows that my Judaism enriches my life, gives it meaning and depth, and has a place in this day and age, because it is continuously evolving to fit our times. Shavuot from Schechter.